Hi, my name is Jesse Anderson. I'd like to introduce you to my new show, Unapologetically Technical. In Unapologetically Technical, we go deep. We go all the way down. And this is what I want to distinguish this show from other shows, where they kind of stay at the high level and they don't go deeply technical. The show's going to be completely different. We're going to go all the way down. We're going to go deeply technical. And that's going to require some time. So what we're going to do is it will, there'll be longer, there'll be video, but they won't just be video of me talking. We're going to have guests. And to help you understand the concepts, we'll also be doing this via whiteboards. These whiteboards will help you understand this and understand the technologies and more importantly, how those technologies work so you can implement them correctly. With me today is Roy Hassan. And Roy is the Senior Director of Product Management at Upsolver. So Roy, to start off with, would you introduce yourself a little bit more? Sure. Hey, thank you very much, Jesse. I appreciate it. Really happy to be uh, the first guest on, on this new show. So this is pretty exciting. Um, like you said, there's not a lot of uh, good shows out there that really go deep. So I'm, I'm glad that you're you're doing this. Uh, so again, my name is Roy Hassan. I've uh, been around the data industry for a little while. I uh, worked for AWS uh, for about six years on a bunch of different uh, positions. We'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, now I head the the product team at AppSolver. Uh, we build a product that makes it easy for users to to build data pipelines using SQL. Excellent. So we're going to get deeper into that whole Amazon background later because I think that really brings something into what we're what you're creating at AppSolver. So you mentioned your background. What makes you so interested in data and pipelines? Yeah, that's a good question. I think generally around data, um, you know, I've been sort of in and out of data for a long time. I mean, my my role previously many years ago was around networking and building data and uh, video networks, not the data that we work today, but, the, you know, the cable modem networks that people use to, to connect to the Internet. So I, I worked on those networks, a lot of infrastructure type of stuff. Uh, but over the years, spent a significant amount of time kind of looking at monitoring data, looking at uh, data coming out of different uh, nodes in the network, a lot of IoT before it was really called IoT, um, and spent a good amount of time trying to analyze that data to understand the performance of our network, to understand you know issues and be a bit more uh, proactive in, in identifying those, those problems. And then once I moved uh, from that space to, to AWS, uh, every kind of every one of my customers that we're working with really spend a good amount of time trying to do stuff with data. And this is, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, but that was really the, the core of almost every project. There were infrastructure projects and there were data projects. And the data projects got me really excited in kind of the use cases and the, 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 the fun stuff that people were doing with data. And I got really excited about it. And uh, that's kind of where where I am right now. But in regards to data pipeline, it all boils down to like, how do you ingest data? How do you transform it? How do you prepare and get it ready for some kind of analysis? So the, the core work has always been in the pipeline space. Like how do I ingest? How do I transform? Um, I get really excited about, you know, Apache Spark and Flink and Presto and, and later on Trino um, and really dove deeper into those, those technologies. Uh, I was involved in the service teams at AWS as well, building managed services around these technologies. Um, and that's where the passion really came in and helping a lot of customers understand how to write good code that, that does data processing at scale. And that was, a, that was a challenge, but it was fun. That's kind of what got me excited. It, it sounds like there's a common theme. And, and for people who are watching this, I think this common theme is important. If you want a career in data, I think all of it stands on this love of data. And if you're coming in, as I'm starting to see, lots of data engineers show me the money. Yeah, yeah, there's money in it, but I think at its core, you have to love data like Roy does, like I does. Yeah. This is how we all start. Yeah, so we we have our, you, you talked about your background. Your background is in sales engineering and product management. How do you think your background in sales engineering create, helps you create a better product? Yeah, that's uh, that's a question I don't usually get asked. So it's it's interesting that you bring it up, but I think it's a good question nonetheless. Um, you know, I, I was in sales engineering for a long time, uh, working in companies like Motorola, et cetera. Um, different companies have different names for it. Like in AWS, we call it Solution Architects. 
Uh, but in essence, you're kind of like a pre-sales engineer. The the core sort of value that you get from from that role is is being able to talk to customers about their current and future challenges. So current, like what are the challenges they're dealing with today, how they're thinking about solving them and, and kind of iterating and thinking about um, solutions with them. And then they also kind of open up to you about like, hey, these are the things that we want to do in the future. This is how we're thinking about it. You know, help us, right? Guide us and, and give us some some guidance on what should we think about? What should we watch out for? What do other customers in this space are doing to solve similar problems? And how can we get there faster? So having that experience and that background allows me to think more in the, in, in, with the mindset of the user and the customer when building data products or building products in general. Uh, so sitting around the room and saying like, okay, what do we need to build? Like, how do we need to improve this? You know, I, I have a lot of intuition, a lot of experience from having those cus- conversations with customers uh, and having that, that way of thinking like, okay, let's dive deeper. What's the problem? How do we get to the root of it? Um, and understand how is that going to impact the business? How will this affect other users or customers in that particular market? Um, that kind of gives me this intuition that allows me to start the product define, defining process, right? Uh, kind of put guardrails around what we want to build, how do we want to, how do we want to think about it, what problems should we be thinking uh, of solving? How do we want to position it, right? Starting to think about that. And then be able to take those ideas, validate them with customers, and then come back and figure out what exactly do we need to go build from a feature functionality perspective um, and kind of over time iterate that with with our customers and our design partners. Another great lesson from Roy. If you aren't directly touching your customer, I I like to say touching them in a HR acceptable way, you're not creating what they're what they want. You can you can try to guess what they want. But unless you're touching them, unless you're interacting with them, you're not going to do this. And I think that was kind of the the reason I wanted to ask you that question is the sales engineer, whether you call that architect or whatever, they're touching the customer. And as a direct result, they create these much better products. And so you were doing that at Amazon. So let's kind of dig deeper into your time at Amazon. Why did you choose to to go into Amazon in the data space? Yeah, good, good question. So, I mean, again, I, I came from the networking background. So, I, I, I worked in, you know, in cable and telco and, and you know, and, and all those those old school systems, uh, data networks, voice networks, cellular networks. So, like a lot of infrastructure networking stuff. Um, and and to me, it kind of felt like there really weren't a lot of new challenges and things for me to go learn and do. It was just you know, different things, just different networks. Uh, sorry, the same thing, different networks, different companies. Um, so I made a switch to to AWS. I actually started as a, um, um, basically we call it a TAM, technical account manager, which is a post-sales um, engineer, right? So after the customers already uh, started using uh, AWS services, I was there to help them, you know, find the best practices and implement solutions and, and figure things out. Uh, and that was really enlightening, right? I spent about a year doing that across the board. So I looked at all the different services that AWS had at that time and supported our, our customers, you know, deploying them and using them. Uh, and what I found out is that a large majority of those projects were actually data projects, right? This is before Glue, AWS Glue was even available, before Amazon Athena. This is primarily Amazon EMR was the, the data platform and Redshift were the data platforms that people could use. Uh, so I spent a significant amount of time working with different customers to First of all, understand how to use EMR as a service. Second of all, understand how to use the, the big data frameworks, right? This was uh, early days Spark, uh, it was Hive, it was um, Pig, and then some of those, those older MapReduce uh, technologies. So just teaching them how to use it. And that's where I kind of got into it and said like, hey, I, I really need to learn this better. Uh, thankfully, I had a 10, a 10 partner uh, Ragu uh, from AWS that sort of said like, hey, let's do this together. Um, so I, he kind of took over all of our day res- daily day, day-to-day responsibilities and I just basically sat for two weeks, learned, practiced, played, built, destroyed, tried a bunch of stuff and really got good at EMR and all the technology and, and kind of the main frameworks around it. And then we switched and I took kind of the day-to-day responsibilities and he learned it as well. So we kind of learned it together. 
Uh, and then we bounced ideas. We figured out how to get stuff working. And then just the thing that we did actually really got us kind of to the next level is that we actually went to our customers and we did lunch and learns. So they were just, they were new and they were starting to use these technologies. They typically had like one person in the company that was, you know, really technical and explored this, these technologies on their own, but they wanted to bring the rest of the company on board, like the other engineers, the other users. So we actually did lunch and learns. We offered that uh, for free. We came in, we said, all right, let, let's teach you about Spark today. Right. And we went into like, what are RDDs? What are data frames? What's distributed computing? Like everything from the ground up. And we did a bunch of these for different customers. And that helped us get better. Right. But it also helped educate the customer and the user of what these technologies are and how to use them. And then that drove more engagements from users. And then we started looking at different projects. Hey, help me, you know, process my data for marketing. Hey, I'm getting some you know, click stream data over here and I want to do something with it. Let's, can you help me? Hey, my, my data warehouse queries are really slow. Can I move them into, you know, Spark, for example, and try to do it there? Sure, right? So we started to take these projects along with our, with our customers and that's where we got a ton of hands-on experience, lots of troubleshooting, you know, building, trying, uh, working very closely with the service teams to, to make sure that, you know, we're fixing bugs and that we're, we're understanding how to use the platform the best possible way. So there is a part of your answer that I want to go back to where you were, where you were learning it and you were just, you were switching off with Ragu. I think that that was who you said that their name was. Yeah. And I've never heard anybody say that. Is, is that a way that you'd recommend learning these technologies? Um, yeah, I mean, that this, this is definitely, this was Ragu's idea. This was not mine. So I think it's a, it's a really good idea. Um, and, and yes, I, I would highly recommend it. If you have the opportunity to kind of collaborate with somebody, whether it's a coworker or even, you know, somebody online, I've, I've since mentored a few other folks that were starting in the space and, you know, kind of got on Zoom calls uh, and bounce some ideas uh, and help them uh, unblock different things. But if you can work together, it's really helpful to kind of experiment on your own and then bounce ideas and ask, hey, I'm getting stuck here. I can't find the answer. What do you think? Or I did it this way. Would you do it this other way? Um, try not to use it as a crutch too much because then you're not learning. You're sort of constantly asking. So somebody is learning. It may not be you if you're asking, um, but it's definitely a great way to share knowledge and share information. Um, you know, I, te I, I tend to dive deeper into the, the spec and the code, like I, I went deep into like the Spark code and try to understand how things working. Um, and that's the piece of information that I would usually share with Ragu. And then, you know, he would go into the actual implementation and configuration um, and, and actually building the code. And he would share how we did it with me and we had different kind of approaches to solve the same problem. So that was, um, I would highly recommend it if you, if you have the opportunity. Uh, if not, I would also say, hey, Go online. There's a, there's a lot of good people on LinkedIn that are doing some great stuff and ping them and say, hey, you know, I'd love to spend an hour with you and I'm, I'm starting new and I'd love to get some some help. Good. So as you progressed, you you started managing data and analytics at Amazon. What did that teach you? Um, a lot of things. <laughs> uh, you know, Amazon is a is a company. I mean, the leadership principles there are extremely powerful. Uh, and when you get into the company, if you really buy into them and you, you're really um, kind of following through with those, what they, they sort of say, um, I think you'll be very successful. Um, so being able to make decisions, being able to bring leadership into conversations or bring, you know, um, you know principal engineers and senior principal engineers into conversations, um, kind of like under the guidance of these leadership principles, uh, really allows you to have a productive and effective conversation. Uh, and you learn a ton. You really, really learn a ton. Uh, and you end up with uh, reactionable next steps that you can move forward and you can actually take an impact either on the service or uh, on, on customers, right? So if you're trying to, you know, figure out what's the best way to, to optimize, right? Like one of the things in, in Amazon Athena is, you know, we were getting lots and lots of queries and we needed to find a way to optimize those queries on our back end, right? How do we route queries properly uh, to the right environment so, so customers get the best performance? Um, and that, that 
that feedback sort of came from the field, but being able to bring all the right players into the room, and this is the Athena team, but also other teams, right? So like the EMR team, and uh, and we brought other um, experts uh, into the room as well from from different teams under sort of the guise of, of customer obsession, uh, diving deep and be able to kind of dive into these problems and solve these problems are really, really eye-opening. Um, so I think for me, that was one of the biggest learnings that if you use uh, if you leverage kind of the leadership principles and you have a set core principles in your company, um, everybody operates within those principles. It makes it much easier uh, and effective for you to to learn and to to make decisions and to get stuff done. And then your next promotion was running product for Amazon Glue. How did that influence your philosophy on creating data pipelines? Yeah, so so Glue Glue is a really great service. So I, I you know I supported um, the Amazon EMR service for a little while, uh, building Spark jobs with with use with customers, um, and then switched to to the Glue team. And Glue basically said like let let's take let's take Spark, uh, and let's make it serverless. So it's very similar experience to what you get with EMR, but it's serverless, no infrastructure to manage, um, etc. So you know with, with that said, you know being able to very quickly take a Spark job and run it on a, on an environment that just runs made building pipelines easier, but sorry, made deploying pipelines easier, but building pipelines was still hard, right? Um, you know, you still had to write the code, right? Whether Python or, or the Scala code, you still got to write it. Typically, you'd write it locally on your machine. You'd want to test it. Now, are you testing it with the right version of, of Spark? Maybe you're testing it with the latest version of Spark because you pulled it off of like Docker Hub or something. Um, and then, you know, when you run it on, on Glue, it's a different version of Spark. Uh, maybe it's missing some of the libraries that you had locally. So that made development actually difficult. Um, you know, it took a while before we solved that problem. Uh, but the development aspect was, was still a challenge. Uh, we had a, a, a piece called um, dev endpoints, which is basically like a, a slice of the, the Glue environment available for users to kind of dedicate to their workloads. And then you can use a notebook, uh, Zeppelin at that time, to be able to kind of test and play around. Um, it, it was okay. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, like it wasn't a great solution. People struggled with it. Uh, it ended up costing them a lot of money. Uh, it just wasn't a good developer experience. So, you know, I think Glue overall really, really simplified the, the deployment um, and, and management of your pipelines, but there were still some struggles around development, right? So if you knew what you were doing and you, you were okay at developing, deployment was a breeze, right? Didn't have to configure anything. You just call an API, you know, point to your script and off you go. Um, but yeah, development was still a bit of a challenge, but I think for deployment, it definitely made things a lot easier. I think that probably f factors into your ethos at, at Upsolver is, you could make things only so, so simple up to a certain point. And, and there was this right. drop off point. And I think that was something that I've observed as well. You could get people to ETL, but there's a pretty steep upward trajectory from ETL to the next level. And I, I don't think that management or even sometimes individual contributors realize that. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, that's kind of what really got me really excited about Absolver as well is that I, I feel like there are plenty of tools who are solving the execution and deployment of your code, but there aren't that many tools that are doing a good job at solving the developer experience. And I kind of I, I call Absolver like the solution though it's, it's unofficial, but it's like it's the the kind of the data development platform, right? It's it's a platform that I can I can get into and I can develop data applications, whether that's you know, a data pipeline that does a bunch of stuff, whether it's just a simple ingestion pipeline that loads stuff into, let's say, Snowflake or Redshift, um, you kind of have that flexibility. But that's the area where I feel um, a lot of the tools on the market today are trying to solve the low code, no code, um, you know, DBT with SQL and then kind of GitOps based, based approach. Um, <clears throat> we're sort of moving more towards the software engineering based way of, of developing. Um, as opposed to kind of like willy nilly throwing some some code at, at Spark and and you know trying to get it working because I've I've worked with a lot of customers that really wanted to use the power of Spark but didn't really know how to do 
uh, ETL development the proper way. Like they know how to write code for applications the proper way, but building ETL code the proper way for some reason was more difficult and just just didn't work. Like people just struggled with it. Um, and, and that was a big part of, of my job as well is really helping people kind of apply software engineering best practices to, to ETL code to make it, you know, more uh, robust versions, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of what excites me about uh, Absolver as well. So just improving, improving the developer experience. Good. So when you were at Amazon, still while you're at Amazon, one of the things yeah. I'd like to hear about are some of those battle stories, some of those battle scars. And it sounds like you have quite a few. Could you tell us some of those about the technical scaling issues that you hit while you were at Amazon? Um, so uh, there's, there's things I can talk about, there's things I can't talk about. Um, there are technical sort of scaling issues on on different levels, right? So there's there's a technical scaling challenges on the customer side, there's technical scaling challenges on the infrastructure side, um, and then there's sort of like, you know, product team in, uh, organization scaling challenges uh, within AWS as well. I think if, if you kind of take those three, the first one on, on the customer side, uh, the challenge that we saw with, with customers, especially on, on Glue, is that Glue kind of gave you this, this spark environment that you can write any code but it boxed you into a set of compute um, uh, instances that you couldn't really break out of and you couldn't really manage, right? So it's like, here's the freedom to write and do whatever you want, but you only get to do it within this box. So cu customers that, that, wrote the, that wrote code and try to do different things kind of hit, you know, hit the wall really quickly. Um, and that's, this is a, a scaling issue where we had to spend a fair bit of time working with those customers to, to first optimize their code, right? Get into the weeds of, of Spark, look at their code. Like, are you, are you shuffling a lot? Are you, you know, should you be redistributing your, your data? Should, be, should you be sorting it before you try to do any kind of uh, join? Should you broadcast join? Like, well, how should you optimize your code to, to take, you know, to, to utilize Spark the proper way so you're not blowing out your memory or, or, or causing problems or just adding a ton of nodes? Like what we did see is that people would just simply added nodes, right? So they'll write a Spark job, it failed out of memory, they just added more nodes, um, <clears throat> but they didn't realize, you know, there were there, there were other issues and, you know, their code was actually running on like one or two nodes. So if they added 50 nodes, it wouldn't make a difference. They just paid more, right? Um, so there was a lot of challenges there that we had to kind of educate the market. We had to educate um, our, our users on how to best do it. And that kind of led to some of the features that uh, we introduced later on around auto scaling. And uh, there's an S3 sh like external S3 shuffle service that made life a lot easier, um, you know, make, providing bigger instance types and things like that. So I think that was probably one of the bigger challenges that we had to deal with. Um, from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, um, you know, without, without sharing a lot of like internal, internal details, uh, you know, Glue kind of started off with, uh, the, this, these Spark clusters. So when you run a job, we allocate a Spark cluster to you and then you kind of get going. The clusters were static, right? Like there was no real auto scaling. Um, we try to match your workload to the clusters. Eventually we added kind of internal auto scaling to those, to those systems. Um, and then eventually we sort of realized that, hey, there's a couple big problems, right? The first one is it's really hard to predict what workloads you're gonna run, how much memory you're gonna need, how much data you're gonna need. Um, it's also really hard to get the, the cold startup time down because you're using a cluster, you got to spin it up because otherwise you're keeping a lot of compute out there for, for no good reason. You got to spin it up. You got to attach the workload. You got to do a lot of work and it takes, it takes time. It takes, you know, one to two minutes at best before your job starts and people expect a serverless environment to be almost instantaneous, right? So when you give the, um, the user experience of this is serverless, which means available anytime, but then it takes you know several minutes for it to start up. Then you got you got kind of like this this uh, expectations impedance problem, um, and, and then the user comes back and say like, hey, what's going on? Like I want this better. So that was one of the areas that we spent a lot of time on trying to optimize the cold startup time, and eventually came up with uh, a different architecture internally to be able to just very dynamically add 
these spark nodes to, to the environment so we can scale up and down very, very quickly. We didn't have to manage these big Hadoop clusters. We really slimmed it down um, and, and really improved it. So I think that, that was a big, big uh, win. The engineering team did a fantastic job at bringing that, uh, the cold startup time down to just you know, a, few, a few seconds, uh, which is very, very impressive. So I think that's one of the, the big um, kind of scaling issues that we had on the infrastructure side. On the organization side, uh, look, we started as a very small team, small team, build the product, and then very quickly grew. Uh, and then the service sort of expanded as well. We had the core ETL service. Then we added the, the Python uh, shell, what we call it. Uh, we also have the Glue catalog. We also had the, the Glue crawlers. Uh, there's a bunch of different components, and we had to start scaling the teams uh, along those, those, those product lines. And um, it, it wasn't really a challenge, per se, to, to scale it. But I think the challenge was, you know, we were core expertise around Spark and ETLing and then had to bring in the expertise for these other components because they were scaling just as fast. Like the Glue Data Catalog, you know, is, is, is extremely important in your, in your environment, right? Like if you're not cataloging your metadata, then, you know, where is it, right? So we had customers who were migrating from Hive Meta stores to Glue. We had customers who were using, you know, uh, Athena, came out at that time as well, they need the catalog. Um, and we had a bunch of scale scale issues with, with the catalog as well that we had to deal with. Uh, so the team had to kind of split up and focus on different things and we had to grow that team. So that was that was an organizational challenge that uh, we had to, to work through it, but you know, hire like crazy and find the right people and make sure they, uh, they follow the leadership principles and then things become a lot easier. So you were talking about some of the difficulties you had early on with the with the scaling, uh, technical scaling. Do you think that that's a solved issue, or is that it's been improved? What What is your opinion there? On on the customer side, like scaling your your pipelines or scaling the infrastructure. Both. Uh, let's say we're using a. Uh, let's say your customer using AWS in this case. Yeah. So I mean, I don't think it's ever solved. Um, it's it's definitely a lot better. Uh, or, or more scalable now. Um, you know, the team, like I said, done a fantastic job at bringing the cold startup time uh, way, way down. So now you can test uh, more, you can test quickly, right? You can run your job, you can, it starts up much faster. You can see if it fails right away uh, instead of, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting and then eventually seeing that it's failing. Um, provided some other capabilities uh, around monitoring so now you can see much better what your memory utilization looks like, CPU utilization, data distribution, things like that that give you more visibility where in the beginning there was no visibility. So as a user, you see things break. You have to see through you know, many, 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 many lines of, of Spark logs to figure out what the problem is. And even then, you're like, well, I still don't know what the problem is. Uh, I just know what the error message is. Uh, so although a lot of those things have been improved. So I think from a scale perspective, you're still going to run into some scale issues because unlike EMR, Glue is, is sort of limited to the instance type that, they're, that, that are available. Where EMR, you can connect to any, any EC2 instance type that you want. Um, so you are going to run into scale issues, uh, but at least you're, you'll be much more um, educated about why that's happening and what your limits are, where in the past you, you weren't. Um, and then on the infrastructure side, you know, again, it, it, it's continuously improving and evolving. Um, the team is adding a lot of stuff. I'm not there anymore, but uh, they're doing a lot of good work uh, around the, the kind of the, the engineering of the infrastructure and improving the scale and the, the speed at which you can scale uh, compute to, to, to fit the workloads. Because at the end of the day, right, the, the premise or the promise of serverless is that you just run your workload and behind the scenes infrastructure will scale for you. Um, so why does it matter what instance type I choose or how many of them? It should just scale, right? Yeah, it's true. Uh, but I also found something in your response that was interesting. Uh, your response previous to this was that you broke down the problem between technical and organizational. And I don't think people realize, unless they've read my writing or, or re read a lot about that, these are two separate problems that you have to solve independently. They may be, they may look like they're the same problem, but they're independent problems. And your 
your um, advice there, if, if I paraphrase it correctly, was hire good people and have good, I guess, core values or leadership values for them. Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the I, I keep going back to this. Like the, the the Amazon leadership principles are extremely powerful. Um, they sound they sound like yeah, I just you know talk, but it isn't because within a company, like everybody, every everybody everybody's guided by those principles. It's not like yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't care. Like when you when you talk when you talk to a vice president, like you can say, hey, in customer obsession. I got a customer problem. I need you to pay attention to it. They're not going to brush you off, right? Uh, so when you get into those conversations, when you, when you have these deep technical conversations with a table of engineers, um, you know, uh, product managers, leadership, like you're you're anchored by these principles. So the conversation doesn't go off the rails, right? You know what you're here to do. Uh, you know what problems you need to solve. Uh, and it's much easier to have a productive conversation. And that's that's really, really helpful because in other companies that I've worked with, many times those conversations have just kind of got derailed because engineering's too busy, they don't want to do it, right? Um, well, they, I, I don't want to do it is not, is not, it's not an answer, right? Like if we have a problem and there's a customer issue here with customer obsession, we know that we need to go solve this problem. If there's other burning priorities, we can prioritize and we can figure that out. Um, but again, it's not like I don't want to do it or, you know, you don't get into these, these long winded, um, unproductive conversations. Like it's, it's very, very direct, very specific. We solve the problem, we move on. Uh, and that, that's, the, that's what helps us move quickly, right? Make decisions and move quickly, uh, and get stuff done as opposed to dwell on it and talk about it forever. Some wise words for every team. I think that. <laughs> they get yeah. stuck in stuck in in that talk and never make any progress. So let, let's move yeah. on to. Yeah. A, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say that that that's why having core company principles is really, really important. Um, don't 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 just list them on your website. Actually, follow through on them and 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 make sure that you commit to them and everybody that you hire meet meet those um, principles. It's really, really important when you're trying to make decisions, especially fast. Good. So let's switch it up a bit and start talking about data pipelines. What is your definition of a data pipeline? Could you give us it in one sentence and then out of that, give a much longer explanation, but just give us one sentence of what that definition is for you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily have one sentence. It's a good, um, good, good question. I, I think, you know, the way I look at data pipeline is, um, basically a, a technical solution for moving data from a source to a destination, right? It's, it's really as simple as that. Um, what you do inside of that pipeline, it's, it's kind of like varies significantly. Um, how you implement that pipeline, what tools you use to implement the pipelines, that's again uh, kind of up to you, but I think a, a data pipeline is really a way to move data from a source to a target. That's that's really as simple as it is. Um, if you kind of unpack that, right? There's different parts of data pipeline. It's sort of like the ingestion step of the pipeline. Like I want to read from an external source and I want to ingest it into some kind of staging location. Then I want to do something with that data. I want to transform it. I want to aggregate it. I want to clean. I want to prep it. And then I want to load that data, right? I want to load that data into a target, uh, whether it's a warehouse, into a data lake, whatever that may be. Now, this is this is kind of the traditional definition of an ETL pipeline, extract, transform, and load. You can look at it from the perspective of an ELT pi uh, pipeline, which is extract, load, and then transform. But in essence, you're doing the same exact work. You're just doing it in a different order. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how I, would, I, I think about it. So my one sentence definition, and I'm curious your feedback on is, it's an automated way to create data products. Um, I think I think that's that's right. I, I think the only challenge I have with that is sort of the it's 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 defining the output, right? Rather than rather than kind of describing what it is that what is it doing. Right, because if the data, pro if the output of that is not necessarily a data product, like maybe I'm building a data pipeline that 
feeds data into uh, an online training process, right? That needs to train my my model, or maybe I'm, it's a data pipeline that feeds data uh, into um, I don't know into my application that's doing some kind of recommendation, or it's it's trying to figure out if if to send an email or not to send an email, right? I, I think that's that sort of it sort of misses that part. Um, but if you can categorize those interfaces as data products, then then yeah, you can you can be right with that. Okay, and I and I think I do because I I was uh, thinking the other day, and I was thinking if if data is important enough to put someplace, then it's important enough to read. And if and if you follow that logic, then whatever reads it is considering that a data product. So if in your yeah. example of we're going to send an email, we're going to do a fraud check. I think that's a data product because we have to maintain that that data, how that data is done, that needs to be automated. We can't just have some duct tape and bailing wire on that. Otherwise, we're going to have all kinds of production outages. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, so yes, again, if you, if you define data products in that way, like the way I look at data products is, is kind of like you look at, at application APIs, right? Um, that that interface, that way that I talk, that a user talks to my data service or data product, that's sort of my definition, right? Because it has to be reliable, it has to be accurate, it has to have a you know a doc, a well documented and consistent sort of interface. Whether that's an actual API like a REST API, or that's a you know a query layer through Snowflake or through Athena or something like that, that's really up to you how you want to implement that. But that that interface, that contract between the, the the producer and the the owner of that data and the consumers of the data that's that's kind of like the the data product that um, users will interface with however they interface with them so in that case yeah I think I think your your one statement does does make a lot of sense so as I promised everybody we're going to not just talk we've been talking for a bit but I also want to whiteboard because I think this is what we need to do to transmit some of these concepts. Uh, as before off air was right. Roy was saying, I'll know that so I'm not moving my hands around and trying to gesticulate of what I mean. We can actually draw out what you mean. So now we're going to move on to the to that whiteboarding section and talk about how do you see organizations create effective data pipelines. Um, organizations creating effective data pipelines I, th I think there's there's a number of of parts to it right i mean um kind of the let's see if i can draw this out here i, I think that the first kind of part of um that work is let's see if i can do this here uh, so i think there's kind of like the development aspect of it right where you need to you need to have some kind of process you know, typically this is a um, a GitOps process, right? This is something where you're actually going in and you have a, a process where you're developing uh, in code, whether it's a UI tool that then compiles to some code, whether it's, you know, something like DBT or your, your Python Spark job, um, you know, your development needs to primarily focus on writing the code and then following the GitOps process where, you know, you check your code into a repository, there's somebody there that's gonna, you know, review your, your code, you're following a CACD um, process to be able to test your code and validate it and then deploy it into some kind of staging environment uh, or something like that. So um, I, I think that's really important. That's something that uh, is, is obviously common in, in software engineering best practices or, or practices in general. Uh, we need to bring that into into our, our data pipeline environment because the data pipeline is getting more complicated. Uh, there are much more uh, folks depending on it. If we want to have a reliable data product as an output of that, that needs to have a reliable process that, that anybody can can validate and audit and, and, and trust in. So I think that's kind of one uh, one key aspect of being successful at building data pipelines. Um, it's a process. Not everybody understands this. Sometimes users come from a UI-based tool that uh, doesn't generate code. Uh, it just produces some artifacts, artifacts, and then they get deployed. Uh, that's much harder to to follow this process. So I, I do recommend you either move to a tool that's more code-based 
uh, or find a tool that lets you have that visual experience, but ultimately produces code artifacts that you can test and you can validate and you can make sure it's doing the right things. Maybe it's not very, very well optimized. It can lead to higher cost on your, on your execution platform. So it's important to, to pay attention to those things. Um, so the, so kind of that's, that's kind of the first, uh, the first thing. I think the, the second thing is, is around having um, some form of, of testing environment. All right. So the, the, the second aspect is some kind of testing framework. Uh, this, is, this is really important to be able to do uh, validation and actually make sure that uh, everything that you're doing is, is accurate. So uh, having some kind of uh, CI, I mean, some kind of CICD process will be super helpful. Again, this is important if your platform um, can be driven by APIs, can be driven by some kind of CLI. Uh, so in Absolver, we expose a uh, Python SDK and, and a CLI, so you can actually execute your pipeline code uh, directly in there. Um, Spark, of course, you can write code and you can execute um, a job to the Spark API, the same thing with Databricks uh, and tools like that. So that that's really, really important. Um, the other aspect of testing is that you want to have... All right, so... The next thing is you want to do is you want to have um, some production data, right? Production data is tough to, to, to get sometimes, but it is, it is really important to, to have. Um, I've seen many, many times um, users sort of use uh, sample data, mock data, uh, pretend production data, uh, and then you get into production and then stuff breaks, right? Oh, I didn't have that field. Oh, in my production data, my timestamp is different. Oh, you know, my production data has some UUID for, for the, the unique ID of the, the record, but in my test data, it's, it's a big end. Um, so like production data is, is really, really important. Um, you know, I, I think the fact that we have data in S3 and it's much easier to, saw, uh, to, to store and much uh, cost effective and easier to kind of pick up from different tools, there should be no reason why uh, your, you know, your, your, your test platform can't use production data. Um, if you need to replicate, if it's coming from a Kafka stream or a Kinesis stream, you would need to replicate some of that data into a, you know, a testing stream that that you can pick up or a test topic. Um, do that. That's really important. Otherwise, you end up finding these these small nuanced bugs in production because you didn't test against the right data. Um, you know, I see oftentimes like in CI/CD pipelines because you're spinning up containers and you sort of contain your code. And then your sample data within that code to test it. It's almost like unit tests at that point. You're not really testing against true production data. Uh, so, so be able to do CI/CD on top of a an Absolver uh, staging environment, or like a Databricks staging environment, or, or Glue or Spark staging environment. Uh, that's really important. And then you can connect to the real life data uh, and make sure that you don't, you know, break it. Right? You can put some some access controls around it. Uh, but that's that's an important aspect. I, I I don't see this happening as much as I probably should, so that's something that I wanted to call out. Um, Before so you I switch off on that, so what would you do? What would you recommend for prod data that contains PII, so personally identifiable information, social security numbers, or credit card numbers, for example? Yeah. So uh, typically in those environments, uh, masking isn't a great idea. So what you end up doing is just uh, basically mocking those fields, just substituting, um, you know, substituting fake data for those values, just as long as they're, um, you know, form fitting, right? So it's the right, the right structure, the right form. So like credit card, you got to make sure that you substitute mock data in there. That's the true credit card, like Visa and, and MasterCard. They all have different prefixes for their card to differentiate between them. So you got to make sure that it's the same thing. Uh, I've seen some. I've seen some tools. Uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but some tools around. Um, uh, I forgot what it was called. Um, basically, allow you to use machine learning <clears throat> to understand the structure and the format of that, that particular column, and then generate fake data that fits exactly kind of the the, the form and the structure uh, of that. So you can use machine learning to kind of 
make fake credit card numbers, put them into your data, and then be able to, uh, to test against it. Um, other times, you know, you may just simply anonymize them, just put some, some random values in there. Not as ideal, right, in case you're trying to catch, um, you know, issues or, or type issues and things like that. Um, I, ideally, if you can substitute with, with a fake data that fits the same structure, uh, that's probably the best way you can go about it. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, if you don't know, there's a there's a whole s several libraries out there that just create fake data, and one of them is creating fake data for yeah. credit cards. So uh, right. definitely, I would make that suggestion to everybody listening. Yeah, yeah. PII is, is typically it's it's a little tougher sometimes, um, but you know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Uh, okay. So uh, next thing, so again, we, we went to development. We say GitHub is important. We went to uh, next step is kind of testing, CI, CD, uh, and then the, kind of the, the production or um, let's just call it deploy, right? Um, the best handwriting. All right, so now, now that you're deploying uh, your data or your your pipelines, right? The uh, so again, I think I think CI/CD is uh, is something that you want to make sure that you're following, right? So that's something that a uh, process that kind of automates your your deployments. Really important, um, you know. In in Absolver, right? We have we have, like I said, we have the C line, we have the uh, the SDK. Uh, everything is is API driven. Uh, everything is uh, SQL based, so you write all your all your pipelines using SQL, uh, and then you deploy it using the APIs. Uh, after you deploy into test environment, you're testing it. Sometimes you can deploy into staging if you want to kind of let it soak for a little while, uh, and then you want to deploy it into production. Again, once you automate it, this goes back to the GitOps uh, process. Once everything is there, it's version control. You can pick the latest uh, version after it's been approved, and then you can deploy it. Into into production in an automated way, uh, any kind of manual deployments of code, things like that, just gets more difficult. Um, it, it's it you know you can easily break things, you can easily do, you know make mistakes. Automate it this way. You can test it. You can validate it. Uh, it's powerful because you also, if you're trying to, if you're doing like a point deployment for like one specific pipeline, if you want to scale that out to multiple pipelines, they can't do it manually anymore, right? So if it's your first one. Small environment, manual deployment's fine. You don't have to worry about CICD. But if you plan to have a lot of different deployments, different cadences, different people working on, on different pipelines, you, you, you do want to start building a CICD pipeline that allows you to automate this process. So you can um, you know, accept those PRs, review them, test them, and then deploy them automatically so you're not getting human errors um, breaking your pipelines. Uh, the other aspect on deployment is there's there's some aspects with regards to especially in data pipelines is if you're if you're deploying a new pipeline for example fairly straightforward right the data doesn't exist in the target yet um, you know you deploy the new pipeline starts bringing in data uh, boom everybody's happy people can see that table in a catalog uh, you're all, you're good but what if you have to deploy a fix? Right. So if you want to deploy a fix, you can still use uh, the CSCD pipeline, but there's, there's a few extra steps that you kind of need to think about. Right. Now that you're deploying some kind of fix to your to your data, well, what, what's going to what's going to happen with it? How's it going to look? Are you going to have a new column? Is the column that was uh, looked a certain way is going to look differently now? Uh, maybe you're deploying a fix to 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 a change in tax code. Right. Or a change in, in the amount of tax that you're 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 collecting. Right. Um, so now the data is all the same. Like it, it, it looks the same, but the meaning is different, right? So you have to find out, you have to kind of have a way to communicate that. So one of the things that's, that's really important in, in data pipeline development is um, the ability to do replay. Slowly right here. The ability to do some kind of uh, replay, right? So I, I, I have an existing pipeline, the pipeline is fine, it's loading data, but I need to go do something, I need to fix. <clears throat> Let's say I need to fix the, the way I calculate um, 
the, the, the total price of something because the tax changed. Right? Now I got to go back and I got to replay that data. Right? That's where, where some of the challenges come in, where I have a pipeline. I got to do an, like an external job that takes the old data, recalculates things, and then, do, and then update the tables. Then I potentially have uh, a breaking change, right? How I have to stop my users from running queries. I got to make the change. And then I got to do it again. So there's there's a whole process around replay, and, and Absolver kind of makes it really really simple uh, to do that. You simply take your pipeline, you rewind that pipeline, and you say rewind it to let's say six months ago, and then this is the new logic that we need to go do. Go rerun the logic on six months data, update all the pipeline, and once you get to the current data, sorry the current time time, then just keep accepting new new records, right? So you kind of stop adding new records, you rewind the clock, you start six months back, you fix everything until you catch up. Once you catch up, then you start again, right? You, you kind of pick up where you left uh, where you left off and then you, you catch up. Um, so having that replay capability is very, very important because, you know, you may think you don't need it, but you are going to need it. Um, <laughs> you know, business is always going to come down to you and, and add a requirement or say, oh, something changed or you know, the way that we're presenting time step is in local time, we need to be in UTC time, um, you know, things like that, they will change. And then you may have problems, right? You may introduce some some bug, right? Somebody, you know, pushed code change that introduces some bug into the data. Now you have some corrupt field somewhere um, and then you have to go back and you got to fix it. So the ability to do replay uh, in production is, is extremely important. Um, I think those are kind of the the big ones. I, I wanted to add on to that. Uh, that yeah, that sure. will happen more than you think. Uh, everybody watching this, as much yeah. as you, you might think, oh, never had to do that. Well, you never had to do that because you were probably creating a software system or you were re- using a relational database. As you start to create these batch systems, these real-time systems, this will happen. And make sure that you have some sort yeah. of plan in place. Otherwise, it's during a production outage or at the very last moment and you're having to figure out how to do this and it's it's not fun. That's right. That's right. One of the one of the other aspects I want to add around the deployment and, and I don't know necessarily where it fits with a dev test deploy. Um, so I'm kind of I'm gonna branch it off of deploy. Um, what this is 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 I, I, I call it stage, right? Um, maybe a misleading name, but I'm gonna just use it. Uh, so many times what happened when you're deploying pipelines is that you ingest data in, you transform it, prepare it, and then you load it into your target, and then you're, you're kind of done, right? Um, and then if that's batch, you get a new batch of data, you load, transform, and sorry, you, you transform and you load it into the target, and Snowflake, Redshift, run your queries, everybody's happy. One of the things that is important in order to be able to deliver reliable, accurate, um, and, and, uh, and, and good quality data is the ability to stage that raw data first and then transform it and then load it, right? So this may sound obvious, but I, I don't really see a lot of people doing this, which is, which is the important aspect. Um, what the concept that we've kind of enforced in, in Absolver is this, this flow of ingest into a staging table in your lake. Keep that as the raw layer, right? So if you have uh, CDC data with, with updates and deletes, like those updates and deletes are not uh, implemented in the stage layer. Like you don't actually merge those changes in the stage layer. You keep them as an append only um, log of the raw data. And then you read from that log from the staging table and then you merge or you insert and upsert those records into your target. And that's extremely powerful because if you did need to go back and replay, if you already merged all those changes in your staging layer, you probably can't fix it, right? It's gonna be much harder for you to fix them in case, you know, and, and unless you need to go in there and, and sort of find that, that inserted row, change that before the updated row, right? So it, be, it becomes much harder for you to fix problems if you're already merging all the changes. So having that staging layer, the append only staging layer is extremely important. The other aspect of that, that that's critical is that if you wanted to build multiple pipelines, so let's say you build this one pipeline, everybody's happy, it's loading some data into Snowflake, uh, clickstream data, you do analysis, fantastic. Now you wanna take the same data 
and you want to do something else with it. You want to build a different view for a different use case. Well, where, where do you get that, that raw data, right? If it came from, from a Kafka stream that was, you know, was collecting data, sorry, Kafka stream that was ingesting data from application events, right? Those application events are gone, right? You may have a retention on, on Kafka for seven days, but at some point you're going to say, okay, that data is gone. If I want to take a year worth of data and use it for a different use case, I can't because it's already aggregated. It's already created for the, the initial use case. So having that staging layer basically says I can reduce the amount of retention that I have on Kafka. I don't need seven days anymore because I'm retaining all this raw data on S3. I can always replay it somewhere else if I needed to. And if I want to add new use cases on top of that same data, the raw data is there, right? So I don't have to ingest it again. I already ingested it once, right? We're in the, the Spark world. Like if the data isn't properly staged, you have to keep ingesting it. You have to keep ingesting over and over and over and over again. And all that stuff is compute cost, right, that you're paying. So if you ingest it once and it's proper, properly transformed, meaning that it's, it's converted to parquet format, it's partitioned, et cetera, et cetera, you can reuse it over and over again in different use cases. So again, it makes replay possible and, and easy. It reduces the retention that you need to keep on your source systems. It also reduces the overload or the, the overhead that you introduce on rereading stuff from your source systems over and over again in case you need to fix and replace stuff. And it makes deploying more pipelines on the same data much easier and more cost effective. So I think that's, that's a, an important aspect to think about uh, when you're building um, data pipelines. And again, that the stage layer can be in S3, it can be in Snowflake, it doesn't matter. It's just up to you based on, on cost and, and how you want to transfer to process that data. So I think that's that was a long story, but um, hopefully this, this makes sense. Yes, and, and everybody watching, as Roy went through these things, each one of these is a battle scar that he probably has stories behind. But each one of these things is actually something he's not spouting off. He's not hypothetical. This isn't some academic thing. These each one of these is is real live. So do take a, take a take some time, understand what he's talking about. Or better yet, you could use a system like Upsolver to have this done for you automatically. Yeah, I've, I've built these on my own, and I've I've, I've helped many customers uh, on AWS and uh, also with Absolver to, to actually build these or, or plan this out and then also ultimately build it as well. Um, it, it, it's hard because sometimes it's a, it's a company culture change. The way of doing things is, is going to be different. Um, not everybody's comfortable with Git. Not everybody's comfortable, you know, with these, these processes. But if you want to ultimately, like you said, right, if you ultimately want to have a reliable, consistent, accurate data product, <clears throat> that you can offer to your users, you need you need to do things the proper way. Like you you can't you can't just wing it and then just hope that things will be okay. Because once things are not okay, you're gonna struggle really really bad to to fix them, and then users won't have that reliability. Exactly, your your users are the ones who who uh, get stuck with the problems. Suffer, yeah. So let's move on to whiteboard number two, and we're going to do a, another question that's kind of the inverse of this. And what do organizations do that gets them into trouble? Oh boy, when it comes to, to building pipelines. Exactly. Um, so I, th I think the first one, and this is, you know, I don't know if you, you saw my LinkedIn post recently, but uh, I think this is one of, this is kind of the big one. Um, one of the things that I think companies don't do a good enough job is having uh, sort of the, the proper conversation between um, the data engineer. Where is this? Oh, wait, wait. Come on. Sorry, sorry. Um, between the, the, the data engineer, right, and the business. horrible but i can do it all right thankfully there's no spell check around this um <laughs> so the uh, the, the the challenge here is that the conversation between a data engineer and the business um oftentimes it's 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 either very uh transactional like hey i need a dashboard mr d 
go and build me a dashboard. Here's the data I need. There's not a lot of questions. There's not a lot of discussion. There's not a lot of understanding. It's, it's very transactional. Um, and, and many times it stems because the, the, the feeling of business is like data engineer is, is this clerk that is very, very busy and they're running around. I need to be very quick and concise with them about what I want. And they're going to just give me what I want quickly and then I'll, I'll, I'll go on. Right. But rarely is that actually the case. Right. They, you know, they will take your requirements at surface at, at high level value and then they'll try to build something, send it or, you know, throw it over the wall. And then you're going to go and say, like, oh, it's not quite what I wanted. Um, I really need to be able to, you know, to do X, Y, Z. So this is really a double sided arrow. Right. Where you got to make sure that the conversation is clear between both the data engineer and the business. Data engineer, you need to understand the context, right? The context of the company, what the company is doing, the context of that, that business user and what the business user needs, not just the requirements, but what problems they're trying to solve. And I think that's extremely important to understand. Not everybody takes the time to understand that. Um, and then the business user also needs to understand what does the data engineer needs from them to be as, as, as effective as possible and to give them what they ultimately want as quickly as possible? Just throwing high-level requirements at the data engineer isn't enough, right? Explain to them exactly what they're trying to get out of this, what, they, you know, what data they have coming in, what should that data look like, what do they expect from the data, um, you know, what, what looks right and what doesn't look right so the data engineer can actually validate some of those things. And then the third one is this has to be like a quick iterative process rather than saying, okay, the engineer, you know, I'll come back in three weeks and I'll give you some, some dashboard. Let me know if that's good enough. Um, it has to be quick. You got to deliver quickly. You got to make sure that you iterate fast. Um, and there's enough, there's enough feed. There's a good feedback loop between data engineer and the business uh, to be able to, to deliver uh, the value that you want. Um, so I think that's, that's an important, that's a really important aspect of what uh, what you need to do. Um, Before you move you off that on that on that business, yeah. uh, what I yeah. saw with the business is make sure that the business is actually competent to go through this. I, I I hit this with a with a client recently where the business you could give them all the data in the world, you could give them self service whatever. They had zero data literacy. And it reminded me of a of an interview I did with yeah. Jordan Morrow, who spends a lot of time on business on data literacy for the business side. Uh, it may not be your purview as a data engineer, but at least double check that what they're asking for is is what they can actually use. And so the the question uh, the follow on to that question was, what do these organizations do that get them into trouble? So what else gets people into yeah. trouble? Yeah. So I think that the point you make. Is, is absolutely uh, on point, right? Um, just to be, you know, be careful there because like data engineers sometimes, that, that's not really your job to, you know, to, to determine whether or to, to make a decision whether the business can use what they're asking for or not, right? You don't want to go into a situation where you're sort of challenging them on that. Um, you want to make sure that you're diving deep into the problem they're trying to solve and are you giving them a solution that will, let them be effective if they ultimately know how to use that data. I think that's a that's that's a different question that maybe that's outside of your purview and outside of your control. So don't don't get bugged down in some of those things. Um, uh, the the other thing I think that uh, companies do and kind of gets get um, gets get get into trouble with is is around hype, right? Um, one of the challenges that you see is that. There's a lot of marketing hype out there. Let me erase this and make it better. There's a lot of marketing hype from a lot of vendors, right? a lot of tool vendors, a lot of open source uh, projects that sounds really good um, and, and, and probably are good, right? Uh, but there's just a lot of noise, right? When you're trying to build technology, when you're trying to build things, um, you kind of look for shortcut and you look for ways to get things done quickly because you're under the gun, right? You're, you're told like, hey, you got two weeks. I need this results. Like, you want to move quick. So I see a lot of businesses trying to find shortcuts and trying to find those, those self-service tools that makes their life easy. And it may make your life easy for a, a portion of your project, uh, project 
<clears throat> but then it could ultimately create some massive tech debt inside the company that you're not equipped to support, right? So if a business team, like a marketing team, for example, says, hey, I really want you know, to do this, this, this process. I want to get data in from Google Analytics and I want to run a bunch of queries on it. But you know what? I don't want to wait for my data engineers. It takes forever to build my pipelines. I'm just going to go buy some, some tool off the shelf like Airbyte throw stuff into Snowflake, and then off I go, right? Yeah, okay, that, it's a good shortcut, and it gets stuff done, but ultimately it creates this tech debt because nobody who is going to manage your, your Airbyte um, connectors? Like if, if that stuff needs to be upgraded, who is going to upgrade it? If there's a security vulnerability in them and that Airbyte connector is connecting to Google Analytics and Salesforce and putting data in Snowflake, but there's a security vulnerability in there that could potentially expose your uh, your passwords, and I'm not saying there is. I'm saying, but you know, maybe in the future or something happens, right? Like, who's responsible for that, right? Now you have very sensitive customer data getting shuffled over. Um, you could be losing that data. Somebody could be stealing that data. Are you allowed even to look at that personal uh, personal data? Like, just because you can connect Airbyte or some connector <clears throat> to Snowflake doesn't mean you have the permission to look at that data. So there needs to be some governance on top of that. Um, so jumping on the hype and saying, wow, it's a cool tool. It looks like it solves my problem. Let me go use it. Um, it it's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster many times. If you want to start quickly and you're a small company, you don't have a lot of uh, engineers or people that can guide you, okay, just be aware that um, you're going to have to change in the, in the near future to be more robust and, and, and have a you know, coherent architecture. Um, but as, as your company grows and you have a data engineer or two data engineers, like consult with them. Maybe you're ultimately going to make your own decisions, but consult with them. Make sure you're building something that makes sense. Um, I see this hype around um, Iceberg, Apache Iceberg, for example. I, I love the format. I think it's a great table format, has a lot of benefits. Uh, but I see sort of people kind of looking at the, the features of Iceberg, like upserting or you know, cataloging and those kind of things and say, well, I don't need Google Catalog anymore. Um, I don't need this. I don't need Spark anymore. Everything's just going to go to Iceberg. I'm like, okay, Iceberg just doesn't live on its own, right? It's like a real iceberg. <laughs> it floats in the middle of the ocean. Um, you know, there's other tools that have to plug into it are all the things you want to do supporting Iceberg, right? If you're querying data from some query engine that doesn't support Iceberg, then write, using Spark to write into Iceberg is not going to help you. Right? You can't access that data after that point. Right? So don't jump on the hype bandwagon for everything. Do due diligence. Think about it. Um, talk to your data engineer. Really understand that. So I, I just wrote in there, yeah. many tools. And uh, I, that was a point I wanted to make stand out. Uh, if you're coming from small data or maybe software engineering, maybe even data warehousing, yours to that one tool. I just use Oracle. I just use Informatica. And that really isn't the case in on the big data side, on this data side of, yes, you're going to have to use Spark and this and this and this. It's not just one anymore. So, uh, okay, well, right. what else uh, What else gets people into trouble? I think I think the last, so um, hype is, is definitely one of them. I think... Um, the other one that I see people kind of gets people in, into trouble is um, pace, right? So be able to, or having the need to go, having the need to go fast tends to get people into, into trouble, right? Um, because you ultimately make these, you're ultimately, you're ultimately making decisions that are in favor of speed rather than in favor of the, the, the the best thing for your company, right? Um, this this happens often when the business is sort of driving the the projects and saying, "Hey, I need this. I need this data very like tomorrow, or I need you to build this pipeline that moves this data from point A to point B very quickly because I need to make decisions. Forget forget about how what it looks like. Just just get it over there, right? So it kind of like follow up on the hype. The the fact that Companies wants to move fast. They're willing to make compromises around best practices, best architecture design practices, um, the best tool for the job, 
uh, cost sometimes. Uh, and then, you know, when it first happens, it's okay. Like it kind of feels like, okay, fine. Well, we got our job done. But as you start using it over time, like all of a sudden your costs starting to skyrocket, right? Your architecture is starting to kind of fall apart. You can't do more with it, right? It doesn't really scale as much. I see, I see, I see this often, like actually a lot, a lot more times than I really wanted to, where people sort of pick a tool because it sounds right. Um, and they got to move really quickly and make quick decisions. And then six months go by and then all of a sudden it's way, way too expensive than they anticipated. Right. Or they want to layer this new use case on top of it. And well, they can't do that anymore. Right. You see this with data warehousing. Right. I, I don't I'm not I don't want to talk trash about data warehousing. I think it's, it's great technologies and it solves a lot of things. But, you know, it's, it's not it's not the answer to everything. Right. There's there's plenty of things out there. Like, you know, for example, uh, if you want to train your models like machine learning models, if you want to do, um, you know, li- uh, online training, even offline training. Like data warehouse isn't really for that, right? You bring data into the warehouse because you want to build aggregations and you want to kind of normalize your data to to, to do analytics on top of that. Um, that data is usually not really prepared for what you need to do for machine learning, right? For training, right? So you got to export the data from the warehouse into some other process, and then you got to write a bunch of other work to to transform it. And just it's not the right tool for that, and then. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Um, do you want to do it? Probably not, right? Is it going to scale as your data volume increases, as more people want to build models and be more selfish, uh, self-service? Probably not, right? So you, you need to think about those things. Like what are some of the, um, the additional things you want to do in the future? And, you know, don't, don't let the need to go fast um, force you into corners that are going to be very, very hard for you to get out of later and potentially will cost you a lot of money. Um, I think that's another big one. Haste makes waste. Yeah, exactly. And one one point I wanted to add on to what you're talking about is if you're a brand new team, if you're a beginner team and you're trying to go really fast, that's the absolute worst time because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, if, yeah. if you, if you really want to go fast, go, Maybe you hire somebody who, who's done it before. Maybe you get some outside help on this. That can make you go fast. But a team kind of trying to do this all themselves, oh, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, I've cleaned up yep, a few of those absolutely. messes. Yep. No, I, I com- completely agree. And, you know, I, I see this over and over again, and that's why I want to I wanna call it out. Um, I think the last one, and this is, this is kind of on a fence. I, th- I think people will have different opinions about this, uh, but this is this is about uh, best practices, right? That's something that I think different people have different opinions about it, but it's 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 really important, and that's something that in Absolver uh, we sort of took into heart. Um, So we, we kind of took best practices uh, in heart and we said, like, we want to actually build best practices into the product, right? So in, in, in kind of like the, in, in actually all, all analytics, right, whether it's ETL or ELT, there are certain best practices that you need to follow. When you don't have a lot of data, when the use cases are, are fairly simple, it's not that big of a deal. Like, if you don't follow the best practices, performance, cost, going to be fine. You're not going to really run into a lot of issues. But as you start to scale and as you start doing more and more with the data, you're going to start running into these, these issues around performance and cost that, uh, and, and scalability that are going to be hard to fix after the fact. Right? One thing that we noticed, at least that I noticed in the early days with um, Amazon Athena, for example. So Athena is a, is a managed Apache Presto service. And um, basically the, the challenge that we had there is that people would bring a bunch of CSV files in. And they tried running queries against um, against them with Athena. And it, it worked fine for a little bit of data. Uh, and then they start adding more data and more data and more data. And two months go by, three, four, five months go by. And all of a sudden, their queries are super slow, right? And they're scanning a ton of data. And they're like, why is this costing me so much money? Why is it so slow? How do I fix it? Well, okay, there are some best practices you should be aware of, 
right? You should be converting those those CSVs to parquet files. You should be partitioning. Um, you should be optimizing the way you run your queries. Like those best practices save a lot of money and save uh, or, or improve performance in, in significant ways. That if you if you're not aware of them and you're not taking them into act, into consideration, you're going to run into problems, right? And and we see this with you know, in, I don't know, in, in recent months, people complaining about, you know, the cost of, of, of uh, Snowflake, for example, right? I'm running incremental model updates from DBT in Snowflake, and the cost is going up. Well, you know what? DBT isn't really taking many best practices into consideration. It's just compiling some SQL, running it on Snowflake, and then it's good, right? Now they're starting to do more optimizations and things like that. But if you're not aware of those things, then you're going to end up racking up your costs. Um, so... Best practices tend to to be left behind <laughs> many times until you start feeling the pain and then you realize, oh, I need to do this. Uh, one, one thing, and I, I can't mention the company name, but um, in AWS, I, I worked with a, with a very large company who had about two petabytes of data and it was parquet data, but it wasn't partitioned, right? It was flat hierarchy, one folder or one, one bucket with gazillions of files, right? Two, two petabytes of data. Um, and they they wanted to reduce the, the cost of, of scanning that data. And, and Parquet helps a little bit, but you still got to go and you got to touch every single file to see whether the data, uh, data exists in that file or not. So they wanted to introduce partitioning. Um, that's the best practice, right? Partitioning basically says I want to group my data based on a specific column, like, you know, a month or year, typically. Um, so it improves the, the, the performance and also reduces the cost of, of data scan. But to, re, to move two petabytes of data from one bucket to another bucket and reorder it based on, on folders, it's a lot of money. It's, 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 a, it's a big cost for the customer to actually re, rearrange the data in partition order. Now, this is an older company, so they, they couldn't really plan ahead too much. Um, but uh, that's kind of indication of, you know, it's going to cost you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to, to be able, actually more than that, uh, to be able to reshuffle your data into partitions um, instead of planning ahead and doing it. So don't get yourself into trouble by just like, ah, you know, I'll deal with it later. And then later comes and then like, oh, my God, it's a big price tag if I want to actually fix it. Um, so think about it. From, from an absorber perspective, we, we actually bake these best practices into the product. So when you, when you build the pipeline and we output into a data lake table, we automatically write into parquet files. We automatically partition the data, right? We, we actually have a default partitioning uh, using uh, timestamps, right? So we partition based on year, month, and day automatically, right? So if you don't define any partitioning, we just do it, right? You can define partitioning for something else if you want to do different columns, but it's already done for you. We do compaction behind the scenes, which means that we merge lots of small files into bigger files, so you get better performance that way. Those are best practices that today most users have to kind of implement on their own. We're baking them into the product. Uh, and that's, that's important. I, I'd love to see more products out there baking best practices into their tools rather than asking the users to implement them because that's much harder to do, right? And I think that's a really key point that you're making. Best practices are generally not built in these tools. It's an exercise of the user yeah. and most of the users aren't up to the, to the challenge of it, quite frankly. So the more, the yeah, more they can right. be brought baked in, the better off you'll be. So moving. That's right. and, and you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. No, no I, I was going to say from, um, from like, from like the new the, kind of the modern data stack perspective, like, you know, I love DBT. I think it's a great tool, but it's, it's an abstraction layer for users who don't necessarily under, fully understand all the best practices that's required on their target system, whether you transforming data on Snowflake or Redshift or BigQuery or Absolver or whoever, right? DBT needs to take the ownership of taking the, the SQL or the, the, the Jinja templates that I write inside of DBT and compiling them into a fully optimized uh, following best practices sort of code that when it gets executed on the target system, it gives you the best performance and the, the best cost, right? Um, I, I think they're going there. They're starting to do more and more of this. But again, it's, it's one more abstraction layer for the end user. The user doesn't necessarily see 
the code that gets compiled and gets run on their warehouse, they only see the code that they write. And the code that they write doesn't follow best practices because whatever, it's just as simple as possible. They don't understand those things. DBT needs to take ownership of that um, and, and possibly provide some visualization to say like, this is how we optimize your query. Uh, but right now, when you build these abstraction layers, it's really up to the tool to follow best practices and to implement them on behalf of the user. And if the tool doesn't do that, that's where a lot of the pain starts to come in. Well, good. So let's go to the third whiteboard and talk about what are some of the organizational difficulties that companies have with creating their own data pipelines? Organizational difficulties. Okay. So um, I, I think organizational challenges that companies have around building data pipelines um, in particular, I, I would start by saying sort of like the, um, the GitOps process. Oh, I missed. So I think, I think the, the GitHub process is something that is, is, tends to be a challenge. Um, most companies who are building data around, um, uh, sorry, or building data products around analytics don't usually understand this so don't usually follow this so educating the company educating the users educating uh folks in the community who are working with data that this is this is this is the best practice right this is something that the company needs to kind of get around and understand and follow right it's not you know only billy bob over there in the corner as a software engineer he's following it but nobody else needs to follow it like no you know, everybody needs to follow this process. If you want to make a modification to your your pipeline, I think that's something that you 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 need to follow the process, right? You don't just send an email and say make this change for me. If you do that, then the person needs to follow the GitHub process uh, and and you know submit a pull request. This is a great way for you to track everything that's happening in your pipeline. So there's there should be no surprises of hey, why was this thing? you know, broken all of a sudden. Who introduced this fix? Why was this introduced? Who reviewed it, right? Why did you allow this, this change to happen? Um, you see this in, in financial services, for example, around data pipelines where, um, you know, if, if anybody introduces malicious code into the data pipeline, they could potentially be siphoning money, right? They could, they could be potentially creating fraud. Uh, so it's, it's really, really important to have a process where there's an audit trail um, and that's going to just allow you to deliver better, higher quality, more reliable uh, data products and services to, to your company and to your users. Um, the other thing that, that organizations um, struggle with is kind of around, um, how would I call this? I, I think I'd call it like a data strategy, right? Um, so understanding the, the data strategy of your company so, all right, so, so your data strategy, everybody basically needs to align to the strategy and say like, this is, this is how we think about data as a company. This is the importance of data to our company. It's not just a, you know, it could be, I mean, in your company, you might say like data is just a tool. It's just a, a hint, just a way for me to, to, to have another point to make my decision. Or it's something that we as a company are going to kind of, build everything on top of, right? Are we going to be a data native company that really under or data driven company that's going to make decisions based on that? If that's, that's a top down strategy for the company, everybody will kind of get on board, right? They will treat it um, like a core asset of the, of the company uh, with a lot of respect, with security and build best practices around it. So like having a strong data strategy and how you treat data within a company will resonate with the entire organization and people would treat it that way, right? Um, so I think that's, that's something important for, for companies to, to take. Uh, and, and I see many don't really understand, don't really have a data strategy. They kind of jump into it and they start doing, doing things with it. And it, it, it ultimately just becomes a bunch of one-off projects with no coherent strategy, no coherent direction, no guidelines around it. Um, and I think the last one I would say. Well, I want to just add on before you go off of that yeah, is sure. and that is machine learning is not a data strategy. It is part of a data strategy, but it is right. not a data strategy. That's right. That's right. 
um you know you can yeah exactly some people just say like oh yeah that's that's really what it is but it isn't um So the next one is governance, right? I think that's a piece that um, tends to get overlooked, especially in smaller companies, because the the word governance is kind of scary, right? People think, oh, governance, wow, that's that's like security and auditors and all those kind of things. Um, yes, it is. It is partly that, uh, but there's there's a lot of pieces in governance, um, data discovery, um, you know, permissions, uh, entitlements, auditing. Um, there's, there's, uh, oof, other things in there that kind of escape my mind now, but, um, you know, governance is something you should be thinking about, uh, early on. Now it doesn't mean that you have to implement everything. I think data privacy or, or user or customer privacy is probably one of the most important aspects of governance. And that many times boils down to is the data encrypted, right? You got to make sure data is always encrypted. So if something gets leaked, by accident, you misconfigured something, your bucket's left open, that data is always encrypted. You gotta make sure that sensitive customer information is actually protected even further. Like even within the encrypted data, like maybe there's no reason for you to keep credit cards, right? Just delete them. Just don't don't even keep them. Um, you know, if you're gonna hash them, don't 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 hash them with, with something that's that's reversible. Um, you know, if there's if there's PHI, like you know, healthcare kind of health health data information. Like protect it. Uh, permissions, right? Permissions and entitlements are super important. And many times we just kind of say like, okay, just take this data, dump it into my warehouse. Let me query it. Um, but do you have permissions to it? Do you actually have permission to access that data? Do you need all that data? Uh, you know, why am I giving all of that? Right. So permissions are really important. So I think I think within governance, um, you know, encryption, privacy, and and permissions are are really important. So that's something that uh, I think people need to, to pay more attention to. Um, where's my button? Sorry. So it's encrypt. Oh. As you're writing that out, this is kind of what I, what I tell people. Imagine you were a customer of that company and this is your data. What would you like to happen with that data? If it's your personal healthcare information, it's your credit card information, right. what would you like done? Right. I think the next one is, this is not really, that's not the word. Um, I'm getting better at this. The, the last one is, is, is privacy. So I think I think that's, that's an important, those are important things for, for people to remember, right? Um, And you know whether you think you have a need for privacy or not, you do. With uh, with GDPR and CCPA and, and and some of those regulations, like you you need to think about privacy from from day one. Um, many times around, you know, if a small company, you're collecting a lot of data, um, putting it into your warehouse, you do stuff. Most of the users have access to it, um, but then you're gonna you're gonna go for SOC two. Uh, I saw you know. Uh, you know, PHI, sorry, uh, HIPAA and, and PCI compliances. And now you got to go back and you start cleaning things, right? You got to put more governance, more controls, more auditing on top of that. So that's really important aspect um, to, to think about from day one. Now, you don't, again, you don't have to implement everything day one, um, but privacy, think about privacy. Uh, privacy is important. Uh, all of our customer data is, is really important. Like if you don't need to save something, don't save it. Like if there's credit card numbers in your records and you don't need to save them, don't save them. I right? don't don't say, oh, uh, maybe I'll use them later. I'll save them and encrypt them. Like no, don't save them. Um, you can you can ask for that information again. You can find a different way. You can use services like Stripe and others that already maintain that data. Like you don't need to save it for yourself. Um, I've I've seen I've seen lots of customers, especially like in uh, in healthcare and and in in uh, retail, where they just save everything and then privacy regulation come around or a problem comes around, like where we have this data everywhere, we don't really have a way to find it. Um, it's gonna be a total nightmare to be able to scan all the data, find all those items and then delete them. Uh, so it just, it becomes it becomes a problem very fast later down the road. So um, I would just say like, think about it in advance, uh, especially privacy permissions. Again, can come a little bit later on, 
But encryption, encryption is default. Just, uh, everything just offers encryption by default. So just turn it on, right? Just turn it on and then privacy, think about that and, and get that done. I think those are the big ones. Those are the big ones, I think, in, in my mind. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for sharing all that. So we're moving on to uh, four, to whiteboard four. And now we're going to go into Absolver. And part of the reason why we saved talking about Absolver till the last or to the last kind of section is because I, I wanted everybody to understand this is why you why Roy joined Absolver, why an, an Absolver exists, but also why these best practices, why would you even want best practices? Why not just do this all yourself? So we're going to go deep into Absolver now. And we'll start with that question of, okay, we've mentioned Upsolver. What is Upsolver? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Upsolver, um, well, Upsolver is a company. Uh, we, have, we have a product that's called uh, SQL Lake. Uh, SQL Lake, the intention is, as I said in the beginning, is to, to build a data development platform that is low code for any data user that can go build a data pipeline that moves data from a common set of sources to you know, popular set of destinations. Behind the scenes, Absolver will automatically do the orchestrations of your pipeline, right? So you don't need to build Airflow DAGs. So if you have a pipeline that has multiple steps in it, Absolver is already aware of those steps and will make those, will, will orchestrate them for you. Um, Absolver will apply all the best practices to your pipeline. Okay, so, um, so, like I said before, uh, Absolver. So, Absolver SQL Lake is a data development platform that basically lets you write data pipelines using SQL. the The purpose of the tool is to allow any user, not just a data engineer, to write these data pipelines that will move data from a number of popular sources to a number of popular destinations. Now, you can choose to build transformations during that process, you can just simply choose to load the data into your target, let's say Snowflake, uh, and do something with it, right? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, um, so I, I'll start from the top. So uh, Absolver is a SQL-based, um, SQL-based uh, data development platform, right? I kind of look at it like that. You can, you can think about it as a, as a data pipeline tool, uh, but it lets you do, uh, it lets you sort of copy or move data from a number of sources to a number of destinations and be able to transform those, 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 that data sort of in the middle. So you can go from, from the source, you do transform, and then you write it into a, a, some kind of target, right? Um, and by doing this, you sort of create this, this ETL platform um, that allows you to, to do more with the data. So I'm drawing out not, here. This is about how people would could think of Upsolver. Where, yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you call it a sync or a destination, but this is what you can do. You could bring your data in from that source, do whatever transformations as 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 Roy was just talking about in Upsolver, and then That's save right. them. That's right. That's right. And then, and then kind of going back to the best practices that we talked about before, right? This is where um, Absolver sort of does a, a number of things for you. So the first thing is it, it stages the data, right? So you create a, a stage in the lake, right? So now you have a stage of data in the lake. So this is an append-only um, copy of the data. This is where you work off of, so we can build, we, we set retention to this, but all the source data sort of flows from the source through Absolver and then into the staging data. And what this does is it allows you to define basically a table on everything, right? So now whether this is a, um, let's say this is, this is a Kafka stream and we're picking a topic from, the, from Kafka and then we're loading it into the staging table, the user ultimately, when they're working with Absolver, they see a they see a table, 
So they know that the Kafka topic was copied over to this to the staging table, and now they can work off of this table. So the next step that you do is you get you write SQL that allows you to read from this table and actually write it into um, uh, in, into your target, right? So you go from here to here like this, right? So you go from your table back into Absolver to do your transformations, your data modeling, your aggregations, and then you load it into your sync, which is your Snowflake or your Redshift or your Data Lake uh, or whatever that may be, right? So by by doing this, we're uh, we're allowing the user to always work in SQL but work with tables. So whether it's a Kafka stream or an object from a three or a, a table from from my SQL database, the user doesn't care, right? All they know is that they're working with tables. So it's much easier for you to select from a table, aggregate, join, model, transform. Right, that makes the experience much much easier. That's why we're everything is, is done for you in, in SQL. Now, what we also do is <clears throat> we we apply what I call uh, I kind of call it like data engineering as a service, right? Where all the best practices are uh, applied for you automatically, right? So in inside of the lake here, if we go here, like inside of the lake, we do. Um, we do parquet, right? So we write in parquet format, um, partitioned. Uh, we do com compaction, right? So we do all those different things for you so you don't have to do those things on your own, right? And that's really powerful because it automates these best practices. So let's say in the future, if for some reason you decided, hey, I want to move away from Absolver, I want to use something else, the data is, is is in parquet format, fully open, available, partitioned. Uh, everything for you is, is available and you can use it right away. Um, the other aspect that we do is everything that we do uh, from a metadata, metadata perspective uh, goes into the uh, AWS Glue Data Catalog, right? So if you wanted to query that data, so let's say you sync here, um, you know, let, let's say let's say from here, you want to go and you want to read with, um, so this is this thing. This could be, you know, like an uh, S3 data lake, right? And then this is something like Athena, right? So if you're querying with Athena automatically, we already build all the metadata that you need inside the Glue catalog, like define the schema, define the partitions. Um, we update it. So every time new data comes in and you have to, we have to create a new partition, we update the catalog for you. So there's no need for you to run things like glue crawlers that discover the schema and update the catalog. We automatically do it for you. If you're doing an upsert, like an update and delete, things like that, if those events come in through Absolver, we automatically apply them. Right? We automatically manage it. So we don't currently use Iceberg. We do have it on our roadmap. Uh, we don't use Iceberg or Delta or Hoodie. We do the same work automatically for you behind the scene. Um, again, completely open, um, nothing proprietary about it. You can always open up the data and, and, and get access to it. The, the metadata is in the catalog. So that's that's at, the, at a high level kind of what Absolver is or SQL Lake and what, what we're doing. Um, so again, the, the focus here is on uh, SQL-based development, automated best practices, um, and, and fully integrated with your with your syncs to make it easy for you to just hit the ground running. Now, something that I, I wanted to kind of call out as well, and maybe this is something that we can, I don't know if we can clean this up a little bit, but uh, one of the things that we do is when you write these pipelines in Absolver, pipelines typically are not just a job, right? It's not like I read from source and I load to a target. You probably want to do more with it. Like you read from the source, you write into a table here in the middle, now I want to take that table and I want to do something with it. I want to transform it, right? So the next thing I want to do is I actually want to build um, a SQL query that does other things. I want to transform. I want to model. I want to mask. I want to do a bunch of other things before a join, I maybe. write the data into a join. Yep. You can do many, many other things. Now, these are all steps in the pipeline. You can do it in a single job, or you can break it up into multiple jobs. But ultimately, you're going to have multiple steps in your pipeline. 
the challenge with that in, in kind of the traditional Spark or even uh, or, or even the ELT mode where you're doing transformations on, on, on Redshift, for example, or Snowflake, is you need to orchestrate those steps, right? And when you orchestrate those steps, that's typically done via something like Airflow, right? So all these gets done uh, or transformed uh, kind of via Airflow, and you you have to develop these dApps. You have to, to actually write code, <laughs> like in Airflow, to say, this job goes first, and this job, and this job, and this job. You got to schedule it. You also got to build logic. So if, if there's, there's failure that happens, like if job one fails, do you continue job two? Do you not run job two? Do you run job three instead? Should you run a cleanup job, right? You have to be data aware and you have to be job aware. Airflow and similar tools, they're, they're job aware, but they're not data aware, right? Data aware is really, really, really important, right? So like Airflow, you can't, you can't use it because you need to be data aware, right? And what, what Absolver does is, is basically says like, look, we know, we know the jobs, right? We know what things are, are happening here. We know exactly what, um, what data is flowing between each of the jobs. So we actually can be aware. So in Absolver, we have, um, I don't know if we can, can we clear this screen and I can. Yeah, we, let's go, go to five. Five, all right. So let, let's kind of get into because this is a concept. Uh, it's a little bit, um, a little bit different. Uh, so in Absolvo, we have two types of jobs, right? So we have two types of jobs. The, the first one is called a sync job, and the second one is called an apologetically unsync job. <laughs> uh, so these these two jobs are, I think, unique to Absolver, but the unsync, unsync job is sort of like the standard job. That's what everybody has. So there's no depend, there's, there's no real sort of synchronization between the different steps of the pipeline. So what this job does is says, I may have different steps to the job and they're not dependent, they're, they're dependent on each other, but I don't really care, right? If one job stops, I'm gonna keep running the second one, right? There's no need to, to, to you know, to stop it because they're kind of like the unsynchronized, right? So, so in that sense, uh, it's it's kind of willy nilly. Anything that you need can go. So if there's no state, if there's no need to to maintain data awareness, um, you can use this. You can use uh, this unsync jobs. So no state, uh, no data awareness, right? All right. So that's that's when you use unsync jobs. The default behavior in, in SQL Lake is actually sync jobs. And what sync jobs do is they keep, uh, they, they basically, jobs run on a timeline. And that timeline allows us to synchronize between the jobs. Um, right, so we have, we introduce a common, we, we introduce a, a monotonically increasing timestamp column into all the data. And by, by doing that, we are using that uh, as a way to keep all of these jobs kind of in sync. Right, and what this results is that if, for example, I have two uh, two sources, right, maybe two Kafka topics that I'm reading in and staging, then I'm joining those two sources together and I'm writing it to to a target table. If I do that, and let's say source one keeps going and source two stops, there's an outage, right? Something happens. I don't know what happens, but something happens and it broke, right? Now, if the job, the first if, sorry, if the join jobs keeps going, but actually, let, let's see if we can let's see if we can it can draw it right. So, um, let's say we have uh, these these two jobs here, right? So let, let's call it um, let's call it source oops source one, and this one we'll call uh, source two. Sorry for the the, the bad names, um, and then we kind of have these these go into um, so here we have a join table, right? So now, now we're, we're basically joining them, right? So we have data coming in from this guy. We have data coming in from this guy. Uh, and then this basically goes into, you know, um, a target, right? 
uh, let, let's call it a data warehouse, right? So we do we we take two streams and then we join them and everything is cool. Now if if everything is moving fine, that's not a problem. Everything is good. We're 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 good. But what happens if um, you know this one all of a sudden stops, right? So stream one is, go- is stopped. Stream two is still going. If we tell if if the join job continues to join, now it's getting new events from source two, but it's not getting any events from source one. If we're continuing continuing to join or to aggregate, now we're could potentially joining against null values, right? Because or stale table data. Two or, or, or stale data, right? So we're we're kind of joining and we're potentially producing errors that will be fed into the data warehouse because one of our sources stopped, right? Stop producing data. Uh, you know, our, our source two table isn't updated, but our join job is not aware of it. It's just going, right? Now you can you can in Airflow, for example, you can build logic that says, you know, check if job one stopped, check if if something happens, but job one may still be going, right? Because maybe job one is not the problem. Maybe the Kafka stream that's feeding job one crashed or Kafka crashed, or maybe the event stopped going, right? Hardware, everything, infrastructure is okay, but the event stopped flowing. Well, Airflow doesn't really know that, right? You have to build, you yourself have to build custom logic that will test that, that will say, hey, do I have the right event? Um, you know, is, is, is it still going, right? In Absolver, we actually synchronize those um, those jobs together. Actually, the S1 job, S2 job, and, and the, the join job, we synchronize them on a common timestamp that basically allows us to validate if new events are coming in. So if um, S2 uh, sends an event in at, let's say, you know, 10 or 1, 0, 0, but you know, stream one sent the last event was on 9.59.00, then we know there's a discrepancy. We know that, you know, stream two ingested data at 10, but stream one ingested 9.59, where is the 10 data? Where's the 10 or one data, right? So we basically sort of wait and say, hey, we need those two to match. We need both of them to be on the same timestamp in order for us to allow the joint to complete. So Absolver is aware of this and sort of waits for that S1 to, to, to produce more events uh, and catch up to the time and then be able to, to kind of join that data on the same timestamp. So think of it as, as kind of like a, a, a timeline that allows us to synchronize minute by minute uh, the streams. And this could, be, this could be tens of hundreds of different jobs together we actually synchronize all of that together. Now, this is work that you as a user will have to sort of figure out how to implement on your own if you're doing um, some kind of, uh, if you're using Airflow or using a different tool to do the orchestration, right? Because you just don't know when data is ready, when data is not ready. Um, you know, maybe the data is flowing, but it's a little slower than what it should be, right? Usually I get events all the time. Now, if I'm not getting events, I have some hiccups or some, some packet drops in my network, um, I'm going to have a problem. Right, so this is a capability in, in Absolver that I, I don't believe exists in other tools, uh, and it makes life a million times easier. And this is something that we automatically do out of the box. That's that's interesting. So I, know, I know this was a, a long, yeah, a long conversation, but yeah. It's, uh, well, yeah, it's it's a deep conversation, and that's kind of what I wanted to do in this show. Is let's go deep, and this is the level of depth that that you have to go into and talk about timestamps and matching up timestamps. Okay. So w- we've talked a lot about Upsolver and, or, or things going in and out of Upsolver. Now let's double click into Upsolver itself and go to slide six and tell me how does Upsolver itself work? The, so the, the engine itself. Yes. Um, so the, the, the way that the engine work, and I, I don't want to go into a lot of the, the details, um, Lots, lots of kind of like backend details that probably don't need to spend too much time on. But um, so we, we sort of have, we have a development uh, environment. So think of this as a SQL IDE, right? This is where you write your code. This is where you, you go to monitor your jobs uh, and things like that. Uh, again, this is, this is a, a SaaS. So we have a SaaS offering. 
uh, and we have a AWS VPC offering. So if you want to deploy it on your own or you want to run it in the Absolver cloud, you can do that as well. We can connect to uh, your your AWS sources, your you know your Kafka, your Snowflakes, whatever from SaaS and from the VPC. So again, we're we have the we have the ID. Um, what the user does is so the user then write write these jobs and these jobs get executed on on clusters, right? So you may have you know <clears throat> a set of clusters. Uh, this you can start with with one cluster. We automatically auto scale them, so the clusters themselves get the job to run. You can associate a job with a cluster. So from within ID, the same ID, you can say job one run on cluster one, job two run on cluster two, um, and all these clusters are automatically scalable. Like I said, so we um, we auto scale them, and they use uh, EC2 Spot. So we actually use EC2 spot instances, which gives you lower cost uh, automatically. So some of the challenges that people had with using spot instances on EMR, for example, or even on Databricks, uh, Glue doesn't offer spot. But um, with Absolver, we just use it automatically. So you don't even have to make that decision. And spot is basically um, EC2 compute that is less popular at the particular point in time, right? And you can get them at 70, 80% uh, cheaper price. So you automatically get a lot of those benefits out of the uh, uh, out of the box. So you write your code. Um, the code gets gets sent over to to the clusters. Now, these clusters uh, basically use uh, S3 as sort of like the storage backbone. So there's there's a, a couple of things that that we do with S3. So the first one is we use. Um, So S3 is used for, for a few things. The first one that we use S3 for behind the scenes is uh, staging the raw data, right? So we stage the raw data, we build it for you, we create a bucket, uh, we write the objects, we partition them, we manage them. So everything is, is stored kind of in the staging data, uh, sorry, in the staging location in S3. The second thing that we do is we actually store state. So when you do stateful transformations in Absolver, whether it's you know joins or aggregations, if you're doing it on streams or an object, doesn't matter. You have to maintain state somewhere. Now, the clusters themselves have a cache, like a hot cache of all that state information. It's actually compressed um, and it's and it's optimized, so we can store um, you know billions, billions of events. Uh, sorry, billions of uh, state uh, objects in a street. Uh, sorry, in, in, in memory, but then all the state information is, is also uh, serialized to S3. And what that means is that if a cluster goes down, right, you lose the state that exists in cache, in memory, but once you spin up a new cluster, that cluster can hydrate that state very, very quickly directly from S3, right? Where compared to something like Spark or Flink, State is stored both in memory and on disk, like on hard drive. Periodically, that state gets flushed into S3 as, as snapshots. But if a node, if a machine goes down, you lose a large portion of that state because that state is maintained for you inside that machine, like in, on disk. Right? So if the node goes down, that state disappears. Now, when a node comes back up, you can you know, recover some of that state, but you have to recompute a portion of that state again. Now, that just means that it takes longer for compute instances to come back online if you have some form of an outage, right? This is really needed because we're using spot instances, and spot instances can be taken away from you at any time when, when the, the price of that instance goes above what you're willing to pay. So we need to be very dynamic and very quick about adding machines, dropping machines, and kind of shuffling things around. So putting state in S3 is really important. The other important aspect of state in S3 is that you can have multiple clusters that use that state, right? So if I have one cluster is running a job and another cluster is running another job, they can, they can share that state because it's in S3. Like I don't have to copy data and all those kind of things. In Spark, for example, every cluster is on its own, right? A cluster spins up its own environment, its own state. If another cluster wants to access it, they can't. Right. In Absolver, we, we can actually put that, uh, we can actually share that, that state. So it's, it's, a, it's a really 
powerful way to, to, to manage state. The, the third one is um, basically, uh, how do I call this? This is like a replay buffer, right? For, for lack of a better term. <laughs> so the, the third um, use of uh, OVS3 is, is what I call kind of like the replay buffer. And this means that if I wanted to replay my data, I right? remember we stored the data in S3 as, as the staging data, but I wanted to replay it. I want to go back an hour. I want to go back a month, six months, and I want to reprocess and replay the data. Instead of processing all of the data sort of from, from scratch, we actually build um, kind of roll-ups, not, not roll-ups in the sense that they're aggregated, but we sort of take, um, you know, we have, we have minute files, and then we take 10 minutes of those, 10, 10 one-minute files, and we build one file of 10 minutes, right? And then we take five 10-minute files, and we build, you know, a larger aggregate out of that. Now, it's still the, it's still the, the raw data. There's no aggregations, but we create larger files. So if you say, hey, I want to... It's like a compaction. The last 10 minutes... Exactly, exactly. So if you say, hey, I want to replay the last 10 minutes of my data, I can go grab one file that has 10 minutes worth of data and replay it very quickly. If you say, I want to replay 11 minutes of my data, I grab one file of 10 minutes and one file of one minute, and I can replay it very quickly. So we kind of roll it up like this. We compact it in a rolled up manner, so it makes it very efficient and cost effective for you to replay data from any point in time. Um, all right. So you wrote SQL, the clusters um, you know, are, are doing a bunch of stuff. They're writing things to S3 for, for many different purposes. Uh, and then all your, all your transformations, everything gets, gets done, is gets done in memory on, on our clusters. Data is, is shuffled back and forth to S3, again, for you know, actual processing, for state, for the buffer. Uh, and then once that's done, then Absolver basically writes that data into whatever target system you have, right? Whatever you're, you're, you're choosing, whether it's, um, you know, Snowflake or Redshift or back into S3 as, as a data lake table, uh, whatever that may be, uh, we write the data right there. Um, now, sorry, the other things that, that we do is that we do the Glue Catalog, so there's an internal sort of metadata management layer that constantly writes data into uh, in, into the, the catalog to make sure things are updated. So that's kind of the, the gist of how AppSolver works behind the scenes. You can put this in the cloud, you can put this in a VPC, kind of works the same way. Uh, now that we've seen how AppSolver works, what excites you about AppSolver's roadmap? Yeah, so we're right now AppSolver, what our focus is on making it easy for any user who understands SQL to self-serve and to be able to build data pipelines on their own. The sort of the next iteration and kind of the roadmap and what, what is really exciting for me about is how do we then provide that user mechanisms, both automated um, and, and also manual in some sense, that allows them to improve the quality of the data and improve the reliability of the data product that they're producing, right? Because there's one thing to just write a pipeline that loads data into some target and, and call it a data product and be done with it. Like how can you ensure that's actually reliable and accurate and, and, and good quality? So Absolver today, when you build a pipeline, once you run it, it's running. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. If a job fails in the middle, we'll re try to recover it. If a source stops producing data, we'll wait for that source to, to be fixed. We provide a lot of visibility into those components so you can understand what's causing a problem. The piece that excites me about kind of where we're going with this is, is the first one is we're looking at um, adding data quality, data reliability um, kind of capabilities into the product so you can actually define uh, quality rules or we automatically detect quality rules for your data. So as you ingest the data in, there's going to be a set of quality checks that um, get applied automatically. And if data doesn't meet those quality checks, you can trigger alerts, you can write them into a, a dead letter queue and then fix them later. But that's going to give the data producer and the, the, the data product owner 
uh, ability to control the quality of the data that they're delivering to the users. Um, the, the, the other kind of important aspect is, is observability. And I know there's a lot of tools out there on the market that do data observability, but it was really important for us to bake those capabilities into Absolver because if a user is coming to Absolver to build the, pro to, to build the data pipeline that produces a product, you want to have the observability built in because you want to be able to take action right away when things are breaking. Now, one aspect I didn't really talk about uh, about Absolver is that because it's a data development platform, the, the people who are writing or building their data pipelines can go into Absolver, but other users who want to understand how the pipeline is built and what it's doing can also go to Absolver and get all the same visibility and understanding of what's going on. So we layered, we're using the Glue catalog where we exposed more metadata in Absolver. So you can come in, you can say, okay, which tables does Absolver produce? Okay, this is a revenue table that I use in my dashboards. Let me go double click on that table and see in more details how that table was created. What, what jobs are producing it? What code goes into those jobs? Right? So yes, I can go into GitHub and look at all the code there, but it's also in, in, a, in, a, in a nice friendly user interface inside of Absolver. And I can then see who created it, what code they wrote, how is it working? I can double click on the job and get more visibility in what's going on. So we really wanna improve the visibility, observability, and also quality of those data pipelines. So at the end of the day, you can easily write a pipeline that is high quality, reliable, um, and, 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 and follows best practices. And that's really, really important when you're trying to deliver high quality data products, right? You cannot get to reliable quality data products unless you bake those capabilities into the product instead of asking the users to go buy other tools that will kind of give them visibility and, and force them to find workarounds to fix those problems. We wanna bake it in. We wanna kind of bring the data engineering best practices into the tool and make it easy for people to use. Um, so I think those are, those are kind of the, the, the big ones. Um, we're also looking at simplifying our user interface, making it easier. Today, it's, it's primarily a SQL-based interface, so you write everything in SQL. I think the feedback that we got from, from our users is, you know, give me some visual tools, give me some, some drag and drops and click uh, UX experience that um, I, can, I, I can get started quickly. So we're working on uh, a way to uh, using a, a visual experience, actually just load data into the warehouse, right? Many of our users are using Absolver to read from a source, let's say CDC, and load it into Snowflake, and then they do transformations inside of DBT, right? So we want to make that experience easier and more seamless for them by offering a better, you, a better user experience for them to simply create a connection, uh, load data into Snowflake, apply some, you know, some, some basic uh, kind of flattening and, and things like that to the, um, to, to the data before it gets loaded. The, the last thing I would say is that some of the underlying capabilities of Absolver that aren't that visible or that easy to explain are things like strong consistency, um, uh, exactly once uh, ordering, uh, handling late arriving events, um, a bunch of those things that are required to be able to deliver a reliable data to your target that aren't necessarily handled by most tools out there today. And you know, we hear this from our customers over and over again, that those capabilities, the strong consistency, the exactly ones, handling late arriving events, handling uh, the ability to do replay, they're, they're very, very important, especially in production when you run into issues. Um, those are things that you don't catch until it happens. And then once it happens, you struggle to kind of recover from them. We build it into the product. So when we're trying to make things easier by moving data into the warehouse faster, moving into the lake faster, like it comes with all these benefits out of the box, right? And so, so rather than kind of focusing like, oh, hey, what connectors can we have to bring data in? Like the reliability is the real important aspect that we're trying to go after. So rather than, like we said before, rather than jumping on the hype and saying, I should have 500 connectors to a million different places, we're focused on delivering reliable, accurate, consistent, um, good quality data to your, to your data products. That's to us, that's the most important thing. And we want to build features around making that easy and, and as automated as possible. Well, good. I, I definitely see a theme with Upsolver of 
putting those best practices in as, in as the default. So don't make people think, put them in as the default. Well, I have one final question for you, Roy. What do you think the future of data and analytics holds for us? <laughs> the future of data analytics. I think that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a few aspects to it. I, I think from a, from, from a community perspective, I definitely think there's a, there's a kind of like a specialization happening around data engineers, analytics engineers, infrastructure engineers. We're seeing more software engineers actually entering the data space, right? Wanting to do more with data. Um, I call these companies data native companies. Those are ones that aren't necessarily using analytics dashboards and, and, and reports to make business decisions. Those are the ones who are actually taking the data, doing analytics, and actually feeding those results back into the application, right? Like how uh, you know how, how do I know when you know when when my customers are abandoning their cart and why they're abandoning their cart and how do I respond to them? So like that flow requires some analytic processing, but then the results are not a human looking at a dashboard. The results are actually fed into the application to take action. So I really think that that's an area where the space of, of analytics, big data analytics, is going to start um, kind of transitioning more and more towards. Today, we're seeing dashboards and BI and reports, maybe like 80% of the, the, the use cases. I think in the future, in the near future, we're going to see those use cases shift towards more data native companies who are actually using analytics for the purpose of serving their, their applications and their, their customers directly rather than through dashboards. Uh, I mean, that's going to be there for making business decisions and, you know, understanding your business and things like that. But I think we're going to see more and more analytics being used to drive the user experience and to drive application, um, you know, behavior. Well, I, I think I agree with you on many of that, much of that very, very similar p patterns that we're seeing more software engineers. We need software engineers in this. Well, Roy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for going through your background, talking about Amazon, talking about data pipelines, talking about Upsolver. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And this has been Unapologetically Technical. And it was very technical. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. This, is, this was awesome.